I said, how do you know? He says, Maximilian Kolbe. Interesting, eh? But would you like to say a word or two, Elizabeth, about that? Well, I think that Don has done a marvelous job of explaining and uh, where I was coming from. This has been a torment to me. To speak to the mic. Yes. This has been a torment to me because uh, it's very difficult. It wasn't my vision, and um, and it wasn't. It's not my style or anything like this, but when Don asked me to paint this, I just said, well, Lord, I'll, I won't even promise to do it. What I'll do is promise to try. And I worked and I worked and I prayed and I did everything. And uh, this is what I got. I have to trust it is the Lord because it was certainly not me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Can you hold this? Can you hold it in front of you? Yes. And, I'll be glad to. And then I'll do to minutes but no don't hide your face just put it down and then I will I will lead you for in a second you'll understand why okay okay I struggled a long time before deciding to show you this painting at this conference because I think you'll agree it's very provoking. It's very disturbing. But after much prayer and seeking God's face, I felt that I had to show it. It shows so vividly the world as it has been and as it is today. Particularly the artist said it all in her last statement, is not indifference the ultimate cruelty. We live in an age in a world where most people's focus is not on loving God or loving their neighbor, but rather they're focused on me, myself, and I, and the dollar and the joys and comforts it will bring. This is their God. But God has told us that we must make a choice of which road we will travel on, the wide or the narrow. You can get on the narrow road by choosing Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. If you choose Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, then Jesus will enable you to cross over from the broad road of damnation to the narrow road that leads to eternal life. The angelic beings, the saints, and our loved ones who made it to heaven before us. You see, this is what Jesus does. He comes here. I did not chasm. And he's the bridge from the broad road to the narrow road. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you have Jesus in your life, there's absolutely no fear to be had of hell. Not one bit of fear if Jesus is in your heart. Um, we'll put it back here. Let me put it back here. Can you help her, Rose? I'd like to share with you just briefly, a little bit, time is running on, a little bit of my testimony. I accepted, as Pierre said earlier, Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life in my life in 1975. And I've been traveling the narrow road ever since. I was born and raised Roman Catholic, received a good upbringing by my mom and dad, went to church every Sunday. But then in 1974, I was exposed to an evangelical movie. And after the movie, the man in the back tapped me on the shoulder and he said, within two minutes conversation, he said to me, do you know Jesus Christ? So I was nervous. That was a very personal question. I was nervous and I answered back, well, I'm Catholic. I go to church every Sunday and I haven't committed any real bad no-nos, you know? So in other words, I'd be all right, I guess, if something happened, you know? Then that man made me so nervous with his question that I was gone in two minutes. And uh, as I was out of his reach and able to talk to myself, I couldn't say that I knew Jesus with a total satisfaction in myself. So that year was the beginning of my search for Jesus. And it was later that year that my mom had uh, leukemia, cancer of the blood, 
And uh, of course, I was very concerned for her. And so one day I'm visiting her, and I hear about these Catherine Kuhlman Miracle Services. And so anyway, I ends up sending mom there. She comes back completely healed. After an Anglican color, a black priest prayed, laid hands on my mom, she rested in the spirit. And there she knew that she knew that she knew that she was completely healed of cancer. Of course, she came back home just, just glowing, just shining, totally different woman altogether. And I said, wow, something happened there. So I devoured the books that she brought me back. And then three months later, I said, I, I, I've got to go there. So I hopped the bus, went to Catherine Kuhlman's. And there the word of God really spoke to my heart. And after hearing the word and seeing the miracles, I said a very simple sinner's prayer that Catherine Kuhlman led us in. And uh, I was born again into the kingdom of God. You know, I affirmed and deepened vows of my baptism. You know, as an adult, I fully realized what it meant to be a sinner and to turn to Christ. So then, what changed in me? Well, many things, but I'll just mention a few. I suddenly developed a great thirst for the Word of God. I just couldn't read it enough. I remember my wife joking, but she was serious, I guess, to some extent, saying, Don, if you don't quit this, we're going to take you to South Pocopine. There's a mental hospital in South Pocopine. She thought I was, you know, losing it. Eh? But I had such a thirst for God's Word. And anybody who would lend me their ears, I'd talk their ears off about Jesus back then, whether they wanted to or not. That wasn't the right thing to do. I wasn't being sensitive, but I was so zealous. I wanted them to know Jesus, you know, that I'd tell them about Jesus. So I ended up joining an ecumenical movement called Full Gospel Businessmen Fellowship International, which is just a beautiful ecumenical movement. Became very active in it. And of course, I began to hear about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or, as good Catholics, we would call that the release of the Holy Spirit that you received at your baptism and confirmation. So, came a certain point where I really desired this. I had studied it in the Word of God and really wanted it. I knew I didn't have it, according to the way they describe it in the book of Acts. So I sought for it with all my heart, and here I was one weekend at a full gospel retreat. And uh, I'm cutting a lot of corners here because I don't have time to say it all, but that morning when I received the baptism, I received God's love in a very beautiful way, but I also received another gift that I find so precious. People don't like to hear the word sometimes, but it's so precious. It's the gift of the fear of the Lord. In other words, when I lay on the floor after Jimmy had prayed for me, and I, I just went down like a bullet, and I spoke in tongues before my back hit the floor, and I lay on that floor glued to it, I couldn't get up, I couldn't move a hair of my body. I was speaking in tongues, and God was telling me, and letting me know that he was my creator that loved me very much, and I was his creature, and not the other way around, if you know what I mean. I realized then and there the majesty of God majesty of God. And so, after we had communicated with one another, then God asked me to go to the end of the lineup. I think we were about 200 businessmen, and as Jimmy was praying from his end, I was praying from the other end, and people were being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And God was using me in a way, as Pierre said in his, the end of his talk, in a way that we cannot even begin to imagine He will use us in our lives. Well, he began to use me in a way that I would have never dreamt of, simply because I surrendered to Jesus Christ, the Lord of my life, as if to say, well, Jesus, you're the Lord. You do, you know, your will be done, not my will. And that's when I received that release of the Holy Spirit. And it's been one adventure after another ever since, which I don't have time to share them all right now. 1989, of course, I went to Medjugorje, and that's where I met Mary. So I won't repeat that. I shared that a while ago. Now I'm getting, I guess, to the heart of it all. I will now quote you what the Catholic Church has to say about the Eucharist. In section 1364 in the Catholic Catechism, right over here, 
here's what it says. In the New Testament, the memorial takes on a new meaning. The memorial takes on a new meaning. When the church celebrates the Eucharist, she commemorates Christ's Passover. And it is made present. The sacrifice of Christ, offered once for all on the cross, remains ever present. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25-27. As often as the sacrifice of the cross, by which Christ our Pasch has been sacrificed, is celebrated on the altar, the work of our redemption is carried out. God's love and the sacrifice of the Eucharist. In section, section 1367 of the Catechism, we read, The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. The same victim now offers to the ministry of priest who then offered himself on a cross. Only the manner of offering is different. In this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered now in an unbloody manner. This is the Council of Trent, year 1562. A few years ago, I did a retreat in a convent and every time I walk by that image that I've just shown you, I would spend time before Jesus and the Blessed Eucharist, but I was just taken in by that image. And then the nun that used to be the superior of the convent saw me looking at it every day, and then I ended up with her small image of it, which I had blown up. But she saw that I loved the image so much. This picture that I've just shown you explains the whole message of God's love manifested to us each day. Each day, every time Mass is celebrated. It's awesome. This picture shows a priest, shows a priest holding up the sacred host. Okay, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but the priest holding up the sacred host. And just above the host, we see Jesus crucified. And on the cross, and God the Father looking down, and next to him, right here, is the Holy Spirit. When we look at the consecrated host held in the hands of the priest, behind the veil of our natural senses is in reality, in the spirit world, Jesus crucified. Several years ago, at a crucial time in my faith life, a close Protestant friend of mine shared this experience with me. This is his testimony. Donald, some years ago, I went to a Catholic retreat with a friend. And he says, you Catholics always finish your retreats with a Mass. I says, that's right. And here's what he says, and it's a beautiful link with what I've just shown you. But this is a Protestant who had this experience, and I quote, and, I, and I, as I saw the priest holding up the little white wafer in the air, all of a sudden, instead of seeing the priest and the wafer, all I could see was Jesus crucified. In great pain and had blood flowing. And then he looked at me and he said, stay in your church. See, I was debating at that moment of leaving my church. How do we respond to God's love for us? God has loved us so much. How do we respond to that? God has extended his unconditional love to each of us, to Jesus Christ, his only son. If we wish to love God, then we must extend our life unconditionally to all of our brothers and sisters. 
In 1 John chapter 4 it says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So my friends, the acid test, yes, the acid test is the love that we have, of our love for God rather, is to answer the question, do we, do I love and forgive all of my brothers and sisters? Following Rose's talk, she'll be giving a talk this afternoon on how to overcome your fears. Tonight I'll be speaking about the importance of forgiving others, how God helps us to do this. And I will share how I was challenged and I was able to forgive a very close family member who hurt me immensely.